Every so often within my work, I meet someone that just inspires me so much that I want to work with them again and again and again and again and it becomes a partnership. And in the room we've got one of my big inspirations over the years, Wimford Door. And I'm going to ask Wimford to come up because the work that Wimford does, one, needs more acknowledgement because so many people can benefit from it. But also it fits absolutely with this. And I'm not going to say more about him other than he's one of the people that's inspired me most and helped me most in my life. Come up, Wimford, and... Uh, <clears throat> Tell us all about yourself and what you do. There's always some magic happening <clears throat> when you're in a Brian main room. Last time I was with Brian was two and a half years ago, and uh, I met my soulmate as a consequence of that. Isn't that awesome? Stand up, Ninka, let's see you. The magic today is going to be a bit different because I want... <laughs> I want you to look at everybody that's on your table right now. Look them, just every single person on your table, just for a few seconds, and just take in... No, stop, a bit longer, a bit longer. <laughs> what do you see? Do you see potential? Do you see the limitations? Because we always focus on limitations we focus on oh she's she's looking a bit anxious and she's often a bit depressed and he's terrible at public speaking or he doesn't read very well or she wasn't very good at school or he's a bit shy we think and focus so much on people's limitations i was driving in the north of england one day and uh, i was going to a very important meeting going to land hopefully a very big contract and the phone rang and it was my second daughter and she said dad get here quick Susie's taken an overdose they're trying to save her life where are you Warwick Hospital everything changed everything changed I went to say, tell me a bit more, and the phone had gone dead. And I tried to ring back, and there was, it was number unobtainable. And you can imagine, there was a two-hour journey. And on that journey, I went over all the things that had happened in Susie's life. Yes, she had struggled at school. She'd worked hard, she'd had great teachers but nothing was going in. Reading for her was, was impossible. Concentration was hard, making friends was hard, doing sport was impossible. For Susie, taking in skills was something that just didn't happen for her. I got three other children, all younger than her, and for them, learning was easy and so on. So on that journey, I went over all the things that I tried to do and Perhaps things I could have done and didn't do. I broke every speed limit. You know, every car was going far too slow and every driver was irritating and everything that could happen to slow me up seemed to happen. So I spent my time being irritated and also going over my life with my own daughter. What could I have done differently? And it was agonizing. You know, everyone thought I was successful. I was driving a very nice car. And I'd got my own plane in the airport, and I'd got a nice boat in the Mediterranean. And folk thought that life was successful. But when you've got a child that's not achieving, when you've got a child that's struggling, when you've got a child that eventually, in her case, got to the point that she didn't want to live, you don't, you don't feel successful. So on that journey, I made a decision that if she was to live, I was going to find out what could happen to her so that she had a better life. As I pulled into the hospital, there was sweat on my brow and parked the car, didn't take the car parking ticket, I didn't bother, I thought it's kind of trivial. 
and I went into the hospital and I inquired and my daughter came out, my second daughter, my younger daughter, and she was, wasn't smiling exactly, but I could see she was relieved and a doctor was following her and they said that they think she's going to be okay. But whilst on that journey, I'd made the decision that was to change my life. Now, it was a mad thing. I'd changed industries. I'd developed all sorts of things. I was kind of comfortable doing that, but now I'd got a new purpose. And my purpose was to find out how we find the potential in people. I discovered there was some amazing research around the world. A research that when you pieced it together made a beautiful picture. It was like a jigsaw puzzle. No one else had put it together. But when you're desperate, I'm not a researcher, I'm actually not educated. But when you're so desperate because you've got a daughter's life you've got to save, you kind of do the things, you cut the corners, you break the rules, because there's one very clear objective in your mind, and that's to make your daughter happy again. Well, I was very fortunate, or maybe fate was involved, serendipity certainly, and I kept bumping into researchers. Sometimes I'd be traveling on a plane, worrying about some aspect of what I was doing. I'd be sitting next to a professor who'd got the piece of research that I needed. And that kind of thing happened to me all the time. Like when I wanted a soulmate and I went to one of Brian's events and serendipity took over there. Thank God it did. And all this research was telling me that there is a drug-free way of finding the potential in the brain. So as you were looking at those people in, on your table, I want you to look at them again and say, actually, could there be some hidden potential that they've not seen yet? And when you get home in the mirror tonight, could you look at that mirror and say, is this some hidden potential? So I've only got four minutes left. Brian was wanting me to do some magic and fit into 10 minutes, what I normally take 90 minutes to say. But in our brains, we can make connections to fundamentally change the potential we have. The limitations that we regard in others and in ourselves are all to do with incomplete development of this bit of the brain here at the back. It's called the cerebellum. The neuroscientists that have been studying it call it now the brain within the brain. In practical terms, it's a bit like an electrician that wires up all of the other parts of the brain. When the cerebellum is fully developed, we form and develop skills naturally and completely. And when the cerebellum isn't completely developed, we end up with limitations. So in my daughter's case, she had a number of fundamental basic skills that she couldn't develop. So she could not read. Why? Her eye tracking had never developed. Now, all sorts of experts in reading who pontificate about phonics and all sorts of other things, they ignore the fact that poor reading is in almost every case a limitation of skill development. In Susie's case, it was eye tracking. She didn't need more teaching, the teachers had already done the job and that was one of the amazing things. At the age of 27, my daughter started to read because we completed the development of a fundamental skill here. And that's applied to all of the skills we have. So I've got to cut this long story very short. Susie is now today happy and reading and running her own little business. She's overcome many of, most of, the limitations she had. When we started doing this, I, I opened clinics around the world. And I opened over 50 clinics. Oh, and by the way, I've just published my second book. It's called Stop Struggling in School. And I was a little bit shy about putting it out there, but it went to number one bestseller the same day it was launched on Amazon. Stop struggling in school. I think it's, I think it's 99 pence on Kindle if you want it. It's worth it. It's not a brilliant read because I'm not a brilliant writer, but there's inspiration in there that could change your life or your child's life. Has anybody here gone through that with their own child where they've worried about their future? Wow. St stand up, would you? Because when you're a parent that's passionate about your child and you know they've got potential, you know they've got limitations and you want to over... No, stay standing, stay standing. Because I want to... I want you to stay, stand up. Could you just look at each other 
And as you look at those that are others that are standing up, just say, I know how you feel. Just say it to yourself. Because when you're a parent, okay, thank you. When you're a parent that's got a child that's struggling and you're not asleep at night worrying about it and you're thinking about what life might be, are they going to earn, are they going to develop relationships, are they going to struggle, and then they start to get depressed and you worry, worry about suicidal tendencies and so on. Did you know 93% of people that commit suicide have signs of learning difficulties? That's scary. The correlation is huge. So what we discovered was physical exercise that stimulates specific parts of the brain can make a massive difference. So I've spent the last 18 years working on that. And at least there's one person in this room. Something else magical happened when I arrived today. We were trying to find a table. And we, Brian had said, would you sit somewhere close to the front because you're going to be called up, blah, blah. And this wonderful lady, Diana here, called us down to the table. And she said she'd got an amazing story because she knew me. Because her own son had had an amazing experience. Do you want to just share that? Just very quickly, we've got 30 seconds, Diana. And Brian suggested a uh, uh, Winford Doors program to develop these new neural connections between the left and right brain. And uh, we did the program for two years, and it has made a massive, massive difference. And now all the working parts are actually working in the right way, working in harmony with each other. I can't say enough good things about it. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so how many children are there struggling in school today that needn't be you know i i kind of i own a school so i kind of very passionate about teachers and teaching but teachers are not taught anything about how the brain learns they're brilliant at teaching and they're passionate about it but if you're trying to fill a bucket it's always better to repair the holes in the bucket first and the wonderful thing about susie was what she was able to do in her late 20s had been taught her 20 years earlier. So if you are a teacher, you're getting in far more than you realize. So this was an amazing journey and I opened over 50 clinics to do loads and loads of research. And there's another big part of that story because we started being attacked. We were getting wonderful results. Every parent like Diana there seemed to love what we were doing, but the drug companies didn't like what we were doing. We'd come up with a drug-free solution for something that they wanted to sell medication for forever. And when you cure a problem like that, do you know what? You're killing their revenue. So we had all sorts of attacks. So today we've got a slightly different approach. And our approach is to say, do you know what? There's huge potential in these children. The bigger the brain, the bigger the problem, the bigger the challenge, the bigger the potential. So why is it that almost every billionaire dropped out of school or college? Why is it? We've always puzzled about this stuff. Now we know the bigger the brain, the bigger the limitations that show themselves in school. So we had all sorts of amazing experiences. My time up, Brian, I'm finished almost. No, we had an amazing experience because we started discovering not only were we helping with fundamental skills like reading and concentration, confidence was going up. The more highly developed the cerebellum is, the more automatized your fundamental skills, the more automatic the wiring, the more confidence you have. So confidence is not some mystical psychological thing. Confidence directly equates to the automaticity of the skills you're using at any time. We had all sorts of sportsmen come to us. Sportsmen that actually struggled with reading. And they Reading was improving, but then they came back and said, oh, my sport is getting better as well. I know that was an accidental discovery. And a couple of years ago, Stuart Bingham, does anybody watch snooker? Don't put your hand up. <laughs> Stuart Bingham came to me, he says, he says, I've been at fairly good level in snooker. He says, I'm now 38. Have I missed my chance of being world champion? I said, I don't know, when's the World Championships? He said, oh, there's one next April. I said, okay, well, when you're World Champion next April, will you put Zing, that's the name of my product now, on your shirt for free? He said, of course I will, and he shook my hand. Well, of course, I was watching in April, 
And he was playing some of the most vicious, fierce, brilliant players. And Stuart's confidence was there all the way through. And the BBC commentators were saying, what's happened to Stuart Bingham? He's a journeyman. He's never played at this level before. What's he been doing? And he's just writing a book now to explain that what he was doing was doing the program that saved Susie's life and saved tens of thousands of others. So the impact on him and his confidence and the consistency he had in sport was huge. Now, what does that mean? I've spent the last 18 years thinking about how I can get this to every child. So right now I'm doing all sorts of things, like putting together a scientific advisory board and some of the most amazing professors around the world are signing up to this, which is humbling and thrilling, because we've got to do the science, because one day we've got to get to governments. But that's a few years off. We've got to get to a million children first. So what we're doing is we're putting together a mum's army. Because what I find is mums like Diana and countless others, it's only those mums and dads who are passionate about helping their children that actually do something about it. I've talked to countless parents who have said, no, nah, no, it's too much money. It's actually less than 400 pounds. Actually, it's going up next week, but that's another subject. <laughs> it has to, because we, you know, we've, we've got to cover our costs. It's a six-month program, 10 minutes, twice a day. It's completely personalized, because everybody you looked at on your table, in fact, everybody in this room, has got a completely individualized brain. The circuitry is totally different in everyone. So we've created a completely customized, personalized program and it's 10 minutes twice a day and it's delivered on your phone and your app and so on. And we are determined to reach a million people. Did you know how we're going to do it? We're going to reach it through passionate mums who tell others about it because they're so thrilled and so delighted. The look on Diana's face when she greeted us when we came today was enough for me and it kind of almost broke me because the change you make in Susie's life and in your child's life can be enormous. So if anybody wants to know more about it, I'll be around this afternoon. Don't let any child suffer needlessly. Don't let any adult. I had an 82-year-old come. She, I was giving a talk, and she was sitting down about here in, uh, giving a talk in Southampton. She came up to me afterwards. She said, I want to read and write before I die. I started to say, this is an exercise program. It'll, you know, I don't want you to get hurt. She said, young man, I like to... She said, young man, she said, I get hurt every day because I can't do the things that other people can do. She said, I want to read and write before I die. And to cut a long story short, she was on national television four months later. Trevor McDonald did the same to me and he, he brought a load of people and he put it on national television. So the word has been out there, but it's not spreading fast enough. So there's any passionate mums in this room that say, I want to help other families, other children not go through what they're going through right now. I'd love to talk to you today. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks for 10 minutes, Brian.